So, uh, Berlin, London, Barcelona, why does uh, Yanis Varoufakis stare us so much? What's the political purpose of this trip? After the Athens Spring rebellion against the Troika of Lendes was crushed in July 2015, a number of us decided that uh, it was essential to take that, that spirit of what we try to do in Athens, which is to reboot the European Union, to uh, recreate the circumstances of shared hope by taking this campaign to the rest of Europe. Uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, if we don't, and uh, the ECOFIN, Eurogroup, European Union Council, European Central Bank continue to impose the same policies, uh, the European Union will disintegrate. It won't survive. And its disintegration, whatever we may think about the European Union, is going to bring about terrible developments for all of us. Uh, soon, in July, it will be one year since the famous Ohi from the Greek people. Mm -hmm. Um, after that, you decided to resign to facilitate negotiation. Uh, how do you see that time now, one year later? Uh, do you think it was worth it at all, or how do you see it? Well, I didn't actually resign to facilitate the negotiation. I resigned, this is what I said at the time, out of solidarity to Alexis Tsipras. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I resigned was because on the night of the referendum, when the brave, outrageously brave Greek people gave us a 62% mandate to say no to the Troika, uh, the Prime Minister decided to say yes. And this is why I resigned, because I could not go along with that. Uh, ever since, uh, I'm afraid uh, my judgment and the judgment of most of us who had said no uh, was confirmed. And it was a judgment that uh, by saying yes to the Troika, we were perpetuating the crisis, deepening it, and making Greece less and less sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, what role do you think Spain can play after the elections? In, July, in June for the change in Europe? Oh, I think that uh, the Spanish people on the 26th of June has an opportunity to put a, a government in place that saves Europe. This is what we should focus our mind on. This is not what can we do for uh, Spain and uh, how much money can we take from Europe or what kind of concessions can we exact from Brussels and from the European Central Bank. This is bigger than that. It's all about saving Europe. And Spain is a substantial country. It's a significant economy. It's uh, much greater than Greece. And therefore, it has the weight which is necessary in order to impose upon Brussels and Frankfurt and Berlin uh, a different uh, mentality. To put it differently, Mariano Rajoy, as well as uh, Matteo Renzi, use the weight of Spain and of Italy in order to be allowed to break the rules. This is not going to change Europe. It is not helping Spain, Italy or Europe. We need new rules. We need to rediscuss and redesign together as Europeans the, the way we are doing things in Europe. And this is where the new Spanish Prime Minister, whoever it might be, has an opportunity and it must not be missed. If we suppose, for instance, that it would be Podemos and now with Izquierda Unida, um, do you think they have a plan, a real plan against austerity, a plan that maybe Syriza did not have or did not implement uh, because of the Troika at that moment? Well, it's not a question of having a plan against austerity. We have a plan against austerity. We had one in Greece. I'm sure Podemos has a plan against austerity in Spain. You know, actually, it's very simple. You just stop doing austerity. It's not rocket science. You just stop cutting, hoping that by cutting you're going to create something. You know, butchery has never created anything. Uh, the question is not that. The question is, do we have a plan for uh, answering, opposing, and annulling the threats that will come from the center, from Brussels and from Frankfurt? That is the key question. And is there an intention to confront? rather than to be co-opted. And do we have this uh, possibility to fight? Uh oh, absolutely. Uh, we not only do we have the possibility, but we have uh, very strong tools for doing that. Uh, but what we need to, to acquire is, firstly, uh, a very detailed plan on what to do. Secondly, we need to announce this in advance. 
we must re reject any attempt by the Troika to co-opt the new government into its program even before it gets sworn into government. And we have to publicize this in advance so that the European Central Bank, Mr. Dijsselbloem, Mr. Schäuble, know what the intentions of the incoming administration are. But are you aware uh, if Podemos have this plan right now? Or? It is not for me to interfere in Spanish politics or in the affairs of Podemos or any party. Uh, the, I, I truly believe in the sovereignty of our nations and of our political parties. Diem, the Democracy in, in Europe movement, is not trying to usurp the role of political parties. We're not antagonistic with Podemos or any party for that matter. What we're doing by going from one country to another, by being here, by having our own Diem members here working, is to create a European agenda within which progressives and progressive parties and progressive governments can operate in a manner which is good for the um, Spanish people, for the Catalonians, as well as for Europe as a whole. Do you think that uh, the left in Spain uh, has softened the speech uh, since it kind of appeared, uh, this movement, like uh, with Podemos, I mean? There's nothing wrong with uh, soft spoken words. Uh, we must not allow ourselves to mistake uh, you know, revolutionary words for revolutionary actions. To bring about the change that the Spanish people need and that Europe needs, we must in, in, engage in soft-spoken diplomacy. We must uh, compromise. There's no doubt one needs to compromise. Compromise is not bad if you're trying to come to an agreement with the other side. Mm -hmm. But we must, at the very same time, be steadfast about the important principles. For instance, that we should not simply accept the rules as they are, that there should be no commitment to the previous policies that the Rajoy government has been uh, uh, following. There's no doubt that the European Central Bank and the Eurogroup will try to impose upon the new government uh, the policies of the previous government. That is where we must not be soft. We must be very hard on this and soft on everything else. Um, talking about uh, cities now, uh, today you will be present at an event with the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, and some other colleagues. A few days ago, it was uh, a year, it was the anniversary mm -hmm. of the election as a mayor. Um, from the municipal government, uh, Colau and uh, her colleagues, they have found themselves with certain limits of power because of lobbies and other, mm -hmm. other kind of barriers. Um, so it shows that uh, even if you have the best intentions, there are always some limits to your power. Of course. So how do you evaluate it? Um, taking the example of um, the change in Barcelona one year later, do you think that um, these limits uh, exist or how can you fight them? As European progressives, we are all looking at what is happening in Barcelona, in the city of Barcelona, and we're all very proud of Ada Colau and her administration. Uh, of course you're going to come up against limitations and constraints. Uh, we don't live in the ideal world that we would like to live in. But what Ada Colau has done in Barcelona is a miracle. Uh, a movement that began as a protest movement against foreclosures, against uh, the vagaries of neoliberalism at the level of the city has entered the city hall and transformed it. Uh, within the constraints that, uh, th that they're facing, our comrades in the city of Barcelona have transformed the way that the city is being run, the budget is being compiled. Um, the city of Barcelona is now producing innovations regarding the financing of cooperatives, financing of businesses, innovations in how to do that which progress has always wanted, to enter the institutions, to be in the institution, to, and at the same time being against the establishment. This is what we need to do at the level of the, the city, at the level of the regional government, at the level of the nation state government, and as, as well as at the level of the European Union institutions. So when people say to me, but the European Union is a terrible institution, why are you saying that we should try to democratize it? Well. The city of Barcelona used to be a terrible institution. Uh, you know, this, all our states were oligarchic, feudal. We didn't turn against them. 
we entered through political action and through mobilization those institutions and try to change them from within. And this is what's happening magnificently here in the city of Barcelona. Do you think that Barcelona itself as a city can lead the change in Europe amongst other cities? Or it's already doing it. I'm, every city council I know, from Leeds, where I was two days ago in, it, in the north of England, to Greece, to everywhere in Europe, is looking at what's going on in Barcelona, getting ideas, and trying to imagine ways in which the experience of Barcelona can be transformed into local experiences. About Ada Colau, how do you perceive she's uh, seen uh, from Europe? Um, from other um, institutions, maybe like European institutions, and also uh, in The Guardian uh, some days ago, there was an article um, asking, uh, wondering if she was the most radical mayor uh, in Europe. Do you agree with that? Uh, how do you think that she's seen in Europe? Well, I'm not sure whether she's the most radical mayor in Europe, and I don't actually know what that would mean, but she's the most radical mayor who's actually changing her city radically and changing the perspective that Europeans have about what their cities are capable of doing. Uh, so there is no doubt that Ado Colau is a major figure in European politics uh, and I would not mind it too much if uh, the bureaucrats, the grey bureaucrats in Brussels, disliked her. That would have been actually a medal of honor for Ado Colau. Um, now talking about uh, Catalonia, mm -hmm. we need to ask about it. It's uh, it's uh, happening something here, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the process that mm -hmm. Catalonia is trying to get independence. Um, how do you see it? Well, I believe in self-determination, strongly believe in self-determination. The people of Catalonia have the right and a historic duty to themselves to make up their own minds on what they want Catalonia to be part of and how they want it to be integrated within Spain, within the European Union. Uh, the people of Catalonia deserve the right to a process which will help them determine their future and their constitutional arrangements. What is interesting is that in the European Union at the moment we have a disintegrating center. The European Union is, is in trouble, is in serious crisis. But that is also an opportunity because it gives us an opportunity to think of the kind of constitution we should want for the European Union to replace those awful treaties that no one can actually read and understand. They were written in order not to be understood and in order to be despised by everyone who tries to read them. So we need a constitutional process for the European Union and that opens up space for the people of Britain to rethink their own constitution, the relations between England and Scotland, for instance, with Wales, with Northern Ireland, with the Republic of, of Ireland. Similarly here, the relations between Catalonia and Madrid, uh, in, in, in Belgium and so on. It's a great opportunity, we should see it as an opportunity, not, not as a threat, to reconfigure the Euro a European Union constitutional process within which we embed constitutional processes towards self-determination and towards a, a more harmonious coexistence of different peoples in, on the Iberian Peninsula and everywhere, uh, everywhere else. And just uh, one more question about uh, the cities. You are talking about the constitutional process. Do you think uh, what role can play the rural, rural cities uh, in a change at European level? No one can wake up in the morning and be mobilized to change Europe. Some of us may, but <laughs> a tiny minority. Uh, what people wake up in the morning and dream of is uh, changing their neighborhood, their city, their, their, their region, maybe their country. But at the same time they understand that all these efforts have to be embedded within a European agenda because Europe is creating the ecology within which we all have, our communities must survive and evolve. So the idea of a radical intervention in your neighborhood, in your city, which is then linked to other cities, the Rebel Cities Network, under the umbrella of a European agenda, which we, at, for instance, uh, at the, Democrat the Democracy in Europe movement, DiEM25, are trying to create, these are all the parts of the whole that can inspire us and give us hope. 
what would you say to those that might consider your plan B, your movement, uh, idealistic? Well, firstly, let me tell you that when I was in government, I had a plan B, and I had a plan C, and actually I had a plan X. But that's not what Europe needs. We don't need a plan B in Europe. We need a plan A. Because Europe is drifting, anchorless, without a plan A. And Diem is trying to create a plan A. This is a European agenda. Is it idealistic? Uh, it definitely. But then again, the world became a better place because there were idealists who at some point, for instance, in the 19th century, decided against all evidence that it would work to form an anti-slavery movement. The idea that there could be a society without slaves was unheard of before then. The idea that we would have a national health service, the idea that we would have social security, these were uh, utopian ideas. Uh, but without them, the world would have been a far worse place. And what I answer to those who say that our DiEM movement is utopian is, yes, it is. But the only alternative is a horrible dystopia. Hey, after your experience from the insights of European institutions, it is only possible to change things from the outside? No. We have to change things everywhere. And we must not imagine that these institutions, just because they are awful, uh, can be neglected and ignored. The slogan that I would like to share with you and with our uh, audience is we must be in and against every institution. We must enter institutions, we must enter um, government, parliament, the city hall, the European Parliament, the European Commission, in order to change it. But after all, this is how history happens, through thesis and antithesis, through clashes, through confrontation. You defend transforming the European Union uh, without breaking with that. Mm. Is the idea uh, of breaking instead of reforming uh, a Europe that does not respect um, its own treaties and laws gaining more and more um, support power? There's no doubt that when you have a deep crisis like we do, there are centrifugal forces that are tearing apart. And there are those from the right, the racist right, the xenophobic, ultra-nationalist right, that want to build borders and fences and uh, go back to the nation, the patriarchal, uh, misogynistic, uh, racist uh, past. Hmm? And there are also forces from the left, comrades of mine from the left, who say the European Union is a new liberal project, let it die, and we'll create something better. I disagree with both, because even though I'm much closer with, with my left-wing comrades, my disagreement with them is that the disintegration of this terrible European Union we have is only going to favor the former, the racists, the ultra-nationalists. It will not, f it will not g create circumstances that will usher in progressives in power within nation states that have been created or recreated after the dissolution of the European Union. This is why we need to stabilize the European Union, to confront it. You see, I'm not a reformist. I believe in radical change. But to ha bring about radical change in the European Union, we don't need to dismantle it. We need to enter it, and we need to force it to become civilized. But through confrontation, not reform. It will be reformed in the end, but through confrontation first. You are critical with the European Union, like I received, yes. but at the same time you are campaigning um, against the Brexit. Mm -hmm. It may be difficult to understand this. It's, um, it sounds a bit contradictory. Or Life is contradictory. And that's why we must uh, be honest with our uh, fellow Europeans, that we need to be sophisticated in the way we look at life. There are no black and white solutions. Uh, what I say in Britain, when I appear in various venues, where, which I do, because I'm campaigning actively against Brexit, is this. No one can accuse me of being a, a sympathizer of Brussels, of being a lucky of Mr. Juncker or Mr. Dijsselbloem or Mrs. Merkel. Uh, so I'm not coming to you here with uh, a narrative of how wonderful the European Union is. No, the European Union is pretty terrible. But 
Firstly, if you vote to leave on the 23rd of June, uh, you're not going to leave because you're part of the single market. The single market forces you to accept rules and regulations about almost everything industrial standards, environmental protection standards, market regulation, who has the right to change, to do the plumbing in your, in your bathroom from, Bra from Brussels. So even if you leave, Brussels will be writing those rules unless you get out of the single market. But getting out of the single market will take decades. So what are you going to gain by voting to get out? You're not going to gain your independence of Brussels. Brussels will still be making the rules and you will not be in Brussels to argue against Brussels. Secondly, by getting out of the European Union, you will accelerate the destruction of the European Union, of this terrible European Union. And what will happen if you accelerate this destruction, this disintegration of the European Union? What will happen is we're going to have a major deflationary depression, depression-like ec economic shock in Europe, um, with major conflict between, let's say, France and Germany, between the East and the West between the north and the south of the continent. That is going to create circumstances that will, in a sense, uh, pull the carpet from under the feet of the British economy. So even if you are out, you are not going to be shielded, isolated, insulated from the terrible developments in Europe. So you do not gain anything in terms of your democracy and autonomy by getting out, and you're accelerating a terrible process that is going to hurt you. So why don't you stay here with us and we confront Brussels together? That's my message. To democra democratize Europe, it's, it's the, um, uh, that the DM uh, wanted in 10 years. Uh, isn't too much time um, taking into account the urgency of the mm -hmm. immigration crisi crisis and uh, um, social crisis, economic crisis? To, don't you think that a European Union is going to crash before? Don't years? confuse the maximum with the minimum. The 25 in DiEM25 is the maximum. This is what we have at most mm -hmm. until 2025 to fix. Maybe you're right. Maybe it will be next year there will be no European Union. The way the European Union is behaving, uh, it's actually undermining itself. So we don't have much time. The 25 in DiEM25 is the most we have. So we're being optimistic. Maybe we have 10 years to save it. Maybe we don't. Maybe we have less. We will try, as DiEM25, to do <laughs> whatever we, we can to speed up the process of democratization because time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. Until when we will see Cyprus exchanging migrants uh, with Turkey, what do you think, what's your opinion on how the Greek government and the authorities are dealing with migrants in Lesbos or Idomen? As Europeans, we must feel deeply ashamed of the European Union Treaty with Turkey. This is not a Tsipras Treaty with Turkey. This is brokered by Chancellor Merkel, by Hollande, Rajoy, by all of them together. Unfortunately, Alex Alexis Tsipras signed it. He should not have signed it. But it's not his treaty. It's a European Union Treaty. And it is a scandal. It will remain in Europe's history as an awful black chapter. Why? Because effectively, what we're doing, come to think of it, is we are bribing an autocratic president of Turkey, somebody who's turning against his own people, against newspapers, against uh, minorities, against even his own prime minister, whom he dis dismissed. We are th th this autocratic president is being bribed by the European Union to the tune of 6 billion euros to do what? To allow the European Union to violate international law on refugees and effectively to bundle them up and send them back to Turkey from Lesbos and so on. Uh, this uh, treaty, this agreement with Turkey, firstly, can't work. Already you can see that it's not working. And secondly, it shouldn't work. Because if we manage to succeed in sending these people back to Turkey as part of this treaty, we will have committed a major crime against humanity. So the sooner we annul this uh, agreement, the better. And the last one, uh, how would you define the moment we are living? Um, which historical moment is Europe is living now? Um, it, it is it a defeat, a window of opportunity, maybe hope? All that bundled together. Uh, Arthur Miller once said that you know that an era has ended 
when its illusions become exhausted. The illusions of the neoliberal European Union, of the Troika, of the European Central Bank and so on, those illusions that have sustained it for so many years have now become exhausted. Nobody believes in them anymore, not even those who run those institutions. But the tragedy is, and the hope, that uh, the new has not been born yet and it is struggling to be born. And during that struggle, you have simultaneously fear and hope. And we should work towards investing in hope. Yeah, I would, ask, uh, I would like to ask uh, another question, uh, maybe more personal. But uh, obviously your speech is very optimistic, which is good because it's <laughs> what we need in Europe now. But uh, have you ever feel disappointed or exhausted of uh, being that optimistical when uh, the Europe we see, it's, well, I don't know how to describe it, but it's not getting better, let's say. Every day, every day, every moment, uh, one struggles with uh, disappointment. The question is, how do you deal with disappointment? How do you respond to it? How do you react to it? Do you react to it with paralysis or with action? If you react with action, then hope springs naturally from the actual action itself. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.